We start with the acknowledgement of the Turbal and Yagara people of this land and the people of the lands that we come from. We will now introduce ourselves. Hi, I am Kavita. I am a PhD candidate with Design Vacuity Design Lab, and my work looks into the intersection of marginalized communities, public space, digital technologies, and social justice. My name is Marcus Foot. I'm a professor of urban informatics in the Vacuity Design Lab. I have an interest in placemaking as well, um, and my research also encompasses um, interest in sustainability and in um, urban informatics. Hi, my name is Dr. Glenda Caldwell. I'm a senior lecturer in architecture at QUT and also part of the QUT Design Lab. My research is about placemaking, digital fabrication, and um, design robotics and media architecture. Hi, my name is Walter Majenek. I am a PhD candidate at QUT and part of the Design Lab as well. And my research is about AR and VR technologies and how they can employ it in an architectural education context. This picture acknowledges the Black Lives Movement and other social movements taking place all over the world. The picture you see here is the 30,000 turnout at the Black Lives Matter rally in Brisbane, Australia. It draws attention to the over 430 indigenous deaths in custody here in Australia since 1991. It is representative of the people who were taken from their lands, who have their lands taken from them, their lands being mined, forced to be civilized, and forced to speak the language of the colonizer. This picture tells us about whose stories get to be told, by whom, and in what. And this is how they stake their right to the city, through a protest. But what happens when the performance is over, when the protests are over? What happens when there are no physical traces left of their presence? This is where radical placemaking is relevant that we take their stories, their stories of protests, their stories of oppressions, and put them in places for the times that they aren't there. As we live in Australia, we draw upon the wisdom of this place, of the indigenous and First Nations people of Australia. The land is not just a resource, but is the carrier of us, all creatures, beings, and spirits. And these creatures and spirits find place in stories, which are then passed on word for word, mouth to mouth. But these stories are hidden and unheard because a dominant narrative exists. What if these unheard stories could be told by the people on their land, of their land? In this presentation, we provide an alternative way to represent voice and story in place. It involves the creation of digital stories by marginalized communities using low-tech technology to create an immersive experience. This is so that those with privilege and power can experience in place what it feels to be oppressed. Once they experience this themselves, they have an understanding, some insight into the experiences of the marginalized and could be the advocates for those without power. Coming from post-colonial theory, Spivak breaks up the process of othering into three kinds. First is that there is the powerful one and there is a subordinate other. Second, the other is considered and conditioned as inferior to the powerful. And third, that knowledge and technology rightfully belongs to the powerful. And in this study, we try to address technology that is built and designed for the powerful and how it can be subverted to serve the other. The literature review covers how communities experience marginalization and oppression, how place is the reservoir of histories, identity and memories how our identities subject us to an intersection of oppressions and exclusions. We then look further into the kind of technologies that can be used to create place-based stories. In our society, our identities help us make sense of what the world is. We tend to organize ourselves into an us group and them group. If we are not part of the dominant group in society, the one in power, the one who makes the rules, you are then subjected to different kinds of social exclusions. But we are also never one identity. We are a mix of them based on our gender, race, religion, class, and these expose us to an intersection of oppressions, depending on where we are at at any given time and place. But place also gives us our identity. Our name can tell someone where we are from, what gender we are, and what religion we potentially follow. This is the politics of place. And place is not inert or static. And here we go back to indigenous knowledge and theory that the land carries all beings and is the reason of our connections to each other and to everything else. In this way, places are hybrid because they hold memories, connections, and relationships. We have hybrid identities and through technology, 
where we are constantly connected to the digital world through our smartphones and digital devices, we are constantly in hybrid place. So how can we make place? And how can marginalized communities make hybrid place? But before we do that, we first explain placemaking. There are typically two kinds of placemaking approaches. First, the top-down approach driven by city officials and developers and um, decision makers to sterilize the image of the city to attract a certain demographic, new jobs, corporations, and cultural attractions. This approach often excludes minority groups and communities who have their history, memory, and symbolism embedded in the land. The second type of placemaking approach is this organic process in which communities modify place as per the experience of living. Communities intervene directly with what is lacking in the environment, irrespective of city approval, resulting in place hacking. This is also known as DIY urbanism, urban acupuncture, tactical urbanism, or urban guerrilla placemaking. These place hacking acts become sites of ground up activism, echoing Harvey's right to the city. To illustrate typical placemaking processes and their impact on social sustainability, we used the case study of the Kelvin Grove urban village out here in Brisbane, Australia. We studied it using the lens of Henry Lefebvre's work on social production of space. Lefebvre saw the physical, mental and social space as one. It is what we refer to as place. He provides a conceptual triad of social space. It is perceived, then conceived and then lived. Perceived refers to the physicality of space such as building and urban space, structures that ultimately divides places. Conceived refers to the imaginations that feature on maps and construction drawings, which represents the division, uh, the vision of architects, urban planners and engineers. And the lived experience refers to the actual acts of living and producing space over time, how individuals or communities make spaces, streets, parks and cities their own. The Kelvin Grove urban village was developed to the north of Brisbane CBD, which presents great connectivity for those who work in the city centre. It has Kelvin Grove Road running um, through its center, cutting the village into two. And what we are now going to do is break down further the social history of the Kelvin Grove Urban Village using Lefebvre's um, triad. Kelvin Grove Urban Village was conceived on the imagery of contemporary living in an idyllic village. The master plan for Kelvin Grove Urban Village was developed in August 2004 by the Honor Institute and Hassel for the main project participants, the Queensland um, Government through the Department of Housing and Queensland University of Technology. Kelvin Grove Urban Village came up on the principles of new urbanism, having been built on infill brownfield sites with close connectivity to Brisbane CBD, high density development with walkability, provision of commercial, residential and educational facilities all in the one neighborhood, sustainable infrastructure and a degree of independence. The vision of the master plan project states, a diverse city fringe community linking learning with enterprise, creative industry with community, creating a new part of Brisbane that offers <coughs> unique living solutions. Calvin Grove Urban Village was meant to be seen as a choice for like-minded people to live and engage together, a place of learning and knowledge sharing and an environment with different activities and place. As Calvin Grove Urban Village developed, the Honorary Institute, the placemaking practitioners involved in the 2004 master plan, led the efforts to encourage community participation and building in this new community. A number of placemaking activities already took place, which included the work of artist Natalie um, Billings of embedding historical text in the footpaths around Kelvin Grove Urban Village, the Sharing Stories digital storytelling project in 2006, interactive projects such as Virtual Fish in 2007, the History Lines project in 2009, and Discussions in Space in 2012. In 2009, the community hub, The Exchange, was formed and run by Communify, the community organization to provide Calvin Grove Urban Village with community activities, engagement, and addressing the needs of its diverse participants. However, in 2016, Calvin Grove Urban Village, um, the principal body corporate, the governing body of the village, commissioned a stakeholder engagement in Calvin Grove report um, by, uh, with QUT in order to understand the needs of the community and develop communication strategies to engage with village residents. The report revealed that with the transient and diverse population pointing 
to a community that is still in its nascent stage and that more effort was needed to build a sense of community. To build a sense of community in place, we propose an, an alternative to the current ways of placemaking. We call it radical placemaking. We use the term radical because first, it is a radical departure from the traditional placemaking structures which involve either the institution or local communities or both making physical interventions in place. We deviate from this by making the intangible present through digital technologies. We take people's and community stories and using smartphone technologies enable communities themselves to put their stories in place. The community leads the story making process. We as researchers and activists enable the process. We utilize radical or critical pedagogy of Paulo Freire to inform these processes. And finally, we draw from Margaret Ledwith's radical agenda for community development, which emphasizes social and environmental justice. Through these technologies, stories of injustice are placed in hybrid place to begin the processes of social change, possibilities of reconciliation, reparation, and social justice. What is radical placemaking? It is the space to protest, to activate on social justice causes. We break down the act of protesting. The protest takes place because you are outside that you are walking, you are bearing flags and a cause. And in do doing so, you are sticking presence to a place. The marginalized challenge the status quo with tactics and subversions. To explain tactics, the Soto gives the example of New York from two viewpoints. One from the top of skyscrapers where the elite feel they own the view and all that is below. The other viewpoint is at, is at down below, the view of those who walk. The ones at the top believe that they have control, but do they really? Despite the grid, the walkers take shortcuts, detours, and subvert the control within the system of the grid. Every day through their walk, they shape their city. The city is merely a backdrop to their stories. They transform spaces into lived places. In a similar way, using analog and digital tactics, this walk is playful as it embodies unpredictability and freedom. The study looks at the creation of the walk as an act of spatial resistance and how mobile technology can validate presence and challenge lack of presence in public spaces. When this work is layered with empathetic stories, what kind of story city is then being created? As we walk, we are all bodies of hybridity. Our identities are hybrid, the land we walk upon is hybrid, and with a mobile phone, we are somewhere in between the physical and the digital. With tech being implanted on us, we are transformed into a cyborg channel. The cyborg bridges cybernetics and our bodies, while the flaneur wanders and strolls through the city. As a cyborg flaneur, we resist these dominant narratives of the city. We engage in social relationships of the urban, wandering around in groups, reading the city, and negotiating it through locative technology. What we are creating is intangible placemaking. It is ephemeral and ethereal, brief and momentary, visual and experiential. It embeds people's knowledge, memories, cultures, and identity into place through technologies afforded by the mo mobile phone. It is intangible because there is minimal physical intervention to public space. Rather, there is the creation of an experience. This experience is created by the marginalized so that members of the dominant group or mainstream public can undergo an embodiment of othering. So what does radical placemaking look like? It involved the creation of low-tech augmented reality digital artifacts using interactive fiction and digital storytelling. Digital artifact here refers to a mobile phone application and possible a website. Augmented reality AR is generally associated with virtual elements as seen in Pokemon Go, the popular game. In this artifact, we augmented location with digital media such as audio, text and video. This is the AR and digital storytelling component. The interactive fiction is what helps with the narrative. It is a computer mediated piece of writing that allows the reader to choose the outcome like in a choose, choose your own adventure books. The artifact will be experienced out in the public realm with the help of a mobile phone. The goal is then to work with communities to develop their own low tech AR digital artifacts where they put their stories in place. Through this, the first gaps we aim to tackle here is that those marginalized groups may be engaged in certain stages of the design of these artifacts, but they are rarely involved into making them. It usually takes an expert. Through the process, we hope that marginalized groups have more control over the narrative and the construction of the digital artifacts. We, also, we are also not interested in making their stories agreeable to the mainstream audience. We want their life, their lived experience to be respected and heard. 
And finally, the accessibility of digital platforms that are used to build these artifacts is limited. They can be expensive or need technical expertise that these communities may not necessarily have. The focus was to use open source digital tools with self-help materials that are easily accessible online. This is the framework of the radical placemaking, which is an offshot of the cyborg flaneur and the one who protests. It has three components, the who, the how, and the what. The who refers to the radical accomplice and the radical community. The radical accomplice here is the social justice worker or the researcher that works with the community. The radical artifact, which is the low-tech AR digital artifact in this study, is what is created. And the process of creating the artifact is participatory design. In this process, the artifact designers are involved in the concept and the development of the artifact. To document the process and to study the impact, the methodology of participatory action research is used. The next goal was to develop the artifact. To do so, the legacy of digital storytelling, situated storytelling and mobile storytelling was looked into. The second column has examples of interactive fiction, which are essentially text-based games. These games are able to take on dark and uncomfortable themes such as mental illness, queer struggles and social issues. These games are narrative driven and allow the reader to choose the outcome. The charm of the interactive fiction is that they are relatively easy to learn and to create. Women or other minority groups who tend to be ignored in game design as both users and designers are typically involved in creating interactive fiction games. In this study, Twine is an interactive fiction tool that is used to create artifacts, uh, used to create the artifact. The third column has a list of urban games. Urban games are those games where the city is used as a playground and which may involve the use of different kinds of technology. The one that is inspired for this study is Pokemon Go, but instead of catching Pokemon, you're walking through the street and catching stories. To account the vast variety of skills that will be present among research participants, the digital tools selected for this study are relatively easy to learn and to use. The main tool used to build these place-based stories is, is, as mentioned earlier, Twine. You can see the graphical interface in the background image. Twine is a free interactive fiction tool available online. The process involves developing a narrative around places and embedding digital media in locations. The intentional design constraint in this artifact is that you have to be in a specific location to experience the narrative. Using these tools, a research prototype called In the Mood for Love, ITML for short, was developed in July, September 2019. This is a tribute to Wong Kar Wai's movie and uses the story of having a crush on a boy as a decoy to discuss personal stories of gender-based violence along with anxiety. To engage in this experience, you would need a mobile phone, headphones, and internet connectivity to access the artifact. A diary, that is the image on your right, was also added for tactile interactivity. Activities for the artifact user to engage with in place. It also served as space for the user to pen their thoughts and ideas. As I currently work out of QUT Gardens Point in Brisbane, the artifact is designed for the campus and the Botanic Gardens, which is right next door. I divided the narrative for this artifact. The area highlighted in the pink is Botanic Gardens. This has stories around gender-based violence and grief. The red colored part at the bottom, that's QT campus, is focused on stories of anxiety and mental health. One of the main design features of the artifact, which is a feature of interactive fiction games, is choice. I provided choice in the narrative so that the user can decide what outcome they want to experience. As you can see, you start at D block on campus, and then you have the option of either going to Merlot coffee shop in the library or P block. You eventually make your way back to D block. This is where I, as a writer, control the narrative. At this point, the real adventure starts. Depending on what you choose, you end up hanging around in botanic gardens or staying around campus. The arrows refer to the narrative, and here you can see the entire structure of the artifact. And each of the locations is overlaid with digital media such as audio, video, images, GIFs, etc., which all have relevance to the narrative. This narrative was experienced by 17 persons over the months of September and October 2019. The artifact was well received. Some of the key learnings were that even though the stories were dark and twisty, the users stuck with the experience. Another was that people felt that while they had been to so many of these places before, they now saw many of them in a new light, in a different way. These learnings from the research prototype and inspiration artifacts have led to identifying the qualities of the radical artifact. 
For example, with regards to presence, we have situatedness, affect, and willful. The other aspects are explored in the paper. And we end our presentation on this note, our case study site, to develop community stories. We will be liaising with community organizations and community groups within the Calvin Grove Urban Village to make this project possible. Thank you for listening to our presentation on radical placemaking.